everybody. Hello all. Uh, thanks for joining my little GoPro color correction slash color grading tutorial video. This is going to focus mostly, mostly on the color correction. Um, just a point of fact, the difference between color correction and color grading is color correction is when you take your source footage and you make sure it's correct. Right? You add the appropriate amount of contrast, you set your white balance, uh, you do all the things you need to do to make it then a, a stable platform on which to create a creative look. The creative look part is the color grading. Um, so here we go. Uh, as you can see here, I've got some, uh, got a raw file right off my GoPro. Uh, yeah, 53. Yeah, I was right. Okay. Uh, the raw 5.3K file off my GoPro. And it is 24 frames per second. So. But there's also some other tweaks that need to be talked about, so we're going to talk about that right here. Uh, the Go GoPro settings. Um, so you want to, in order to fully utilize this, you're going to want to be on the GoPro Labs firmware. Now I'll put a link to the to the site where you can download that firmware down in the doobly-doo below, along with the other links I'll throw in there. Uh, the main settings here, um, for the settings that you change via the menu, uh, but are, will also be changed by this QR code. This QR code will completely set you up. But if you're going to change some from the menu, you want the color profile to be flat, the white balance to be native, and you want to use the high performance uh, video profile 5.3K, 16 by 9 super view, or 16 by 9 wide 4x3 at 24 frames per second. Uh, I don't know that you can do the 16 by 9 wide at 24 frames per second at 5K, uh, but this it'll work fine at 4K as well. We're going to lock the shutter at 180 degrees or 1 50th. Uh, optimally, it would be 1 48th, but that's not an option uh, it's, it, when you're dealing with uh, the menu, I believe. Um, and we're going to set the, the ISO to auto. Just leave that basically how it comes out of the box. Now, in the QR code, there's going to be some advanced settings you, that you can't get to from within the menu on the GoPro. We're going to change the maximum encoding bit rate for the file that it writes on the SD card. We're going to boost that up to 140 megabit per second. Now, in this case, your mileage may vary depending upon what kind of an SD card that you have. Since the GoPro, not even the Hero 10, uh, supports UHS-2 micro SD cards, you're going to be kind of limited. Um, as far as I can tell, uh, based on minimal testing, but a lot of uh, doing homework on the internets and reading reviews, the SanDisk Extreme uh, card seems to be the fastest and, and works best with the GoPro. Um, the, the normal bit rate out of the box is 100 megabits per second. If we can crank up some bit rate, uh, even 120 megabit, uh, that will all the better increase the quality of the file that we get out of the GoPro. Uh, you want to disable the LRV SAR card encoding. So when you uh, connect with your phone to the GoPro when you watch one of the videos that's stored on there and it streams over. It is streaming a lower version copy of the file that is encoded along with the regular MP4 file. So that MP4 file normally has two video tracks and a third track that contains the gy gyro information. We're going to get rid of that lower bitrate video track to save bandwidth and enable us to get that bitrate higher and higher for the video. What this means is you won't be able to watch it over Wi-Fi connected with your phone, and if you upload it to Plus, um, if you use that subscription service by GoPro, it'll take a few minutes before you're able to view it there because it GoPro Plus will have to make um, it'll have to make that lower bitrate file itself instead of just using what was in the file, the original file that you uploaded. Uh, outside of that, we're going to enable global plus local tone mapping. Um, that's going to increase our dynamic range uh, beyond what we normally get with just the flat color profile. And it's going to increase tone, it's going to increase detail in small contrast areas uh, instead of just like squishing all the highlights and, and shadows together. It's going to add a little bit of contrast in small, small uh, areas where there's a shadow next to highlight. Basically, I think you're going to be able to see the leaves and trees a little bit easier. We're going to set the auto exposure dampening to 12 seconds. Uh, you can probably leave this one out because there's a bug in the firmware still. Or if you set this to 12 seconds, even if you specify to set it permanently, it only works on the first time you record after setting this. And then it reverts back to the normal one second uh, time. Basically, this auto exposure, for say for instance, uh, you go from a very dark place where the GoPro has shifted the ISO in order to expose that dark place properly, and then you fly out into the light and the, the time it's going to take for it to drop the ISO down um, to get you where you need to be in order to be properly exposed out in the bright light. 
And we're going to enable 24 hertz, uh, or what they call true 24, um, 24 frames per second, which is uh, normally um, the GoPro will encode the file at the broadcast standard of 23.976, whereas the cinema standard is an exact 24 frames per second. So we just want that exact 24 frames per second. It's going to make our lives easier if we do some visual effects with it or what have you. Uh, enable 12 gigabyte chapters. So as most of you know, the GoPro will chop up your files uh, depending upon how big they are. And that can be a pain in the butt to uh, to join them together. So this will make it so the maximum file size will be 12 gigabit or 12 gigabytes rather instead of uh, whatever the default is. I think it's four or it's three or I honestly don't recall it's been so long. And if you want, you can get that GoPro Labs firmware installed. You can scan that QR code with your GoPro. Best way to do it is turn your GoPro on, set it to uh, in whatever mode it's in. You can set it to uh, the linear lens and just let it look at that QR code. It'll give you a little beep and it'll reboot uh, once it, it's able to see that code. Um, and uh, yeah, that, however that code, because I have it set for set date and time, it's going to change your date and time. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, let's see here. Yes, so what we have going on in this file here is uh, one of the things you know, that we, we want is that 180 degree shutter, and that's gonna give us that sweet, sweet motion blur. Down here, you see that. Um, the problem with that is, is that the shutter speed is way too slow for like midday sun. So we need to put some sunglasses on our GoPro in the way of an ND32 filter. So I like to have an ND32 filter um, just so that I've got a little bit more headroom in case I am in a, an especially bright area. Um, I predominantly use an ND32 in any situation where I am outside during, you know, the, the greater part of the day. Um, you know, just after the sun has, has come up or just before it sets, you might think about an, uh, an ND16, um, increase the amount of light that's going into the camera. Um, in that case, you got to be kind of careful if you could use an ND32, but your shadow is going to be super noisy. Um, so you kind of have to experiment with it. Indoors, you might use an ND8, or you might go naked, depending on how bright the indoors is. So you just have to uh, experiment. Um, you can get the ND filters really cheap on Amazon. Uh, can't remember what brand I have, but they've served me well. Uh, as long as you don't finger fuck them and get them all dirty. Uh, they'll, they'll last you a while. Also, if you don't stuff them into a desert floor from 400 feet, Basically, don't crash with them on. They'll, they'll just annihilate. <laughs> uh, so anyway, moving on. Yeah, ND filter to get that sweet uh, motion blur. This is not designed to really give you a good starting point to then put a creative look on your footage. So you can tell in this footage, as I'm scrolling through here, it looks pretty warm. Like it's the, the colors aren't very cool. They're very warm. And it's very flat. Right, so the highlights and the shadows are very compressed. And the reason for that is the settings that we used, right? The flat color profile, the native white balance, so the white balance doesn't change because that's really a pain in the ass when you have auto white balance and say you're flying over a beach with sand on it. And so the white balance is gonna veer towards the cool, then you go out over the water and the white balance is gonna veer towards the warm. And then it turns into a mess because your correction and your grade especially could really falter under those variable conditions. So we wanna make this is where I really agree with like one of the prime philosophies of, of people who like to fly with no stabilization is the more you can get right in camera, meaning the smoother you can fly and, and the better your camera settings are, the easier it's going to be to get a really great result in post. So you guys are kind of ahead of the game there. So what we're going to do, uh, we're just going to do the basic correction on this one. This is without stabilization or lens correction. Uh, we're just going to do a basic color correction and maybe I'll throw in a, a little bit of a grade to kind of give you an example of what you can expect, um, at least from my, you know, my perspective, just some starting point ideas that you can mess with uh, later on down the road. So I've already clipped, you know, the beginning where the quad's sitting on the ground and the end where it lands. And so we're going to go ahead and just bring it down here on the timeline. Now, obviously, you're going to put music to it and all that stuff and maybe get rid of the audio. I don't know. I tend to like the audio. I, I use it a little bit. Um, I predominantly use it for freestyle, but you're, you know, you can just delete that if you want, or you can drag it down with, uh, just the video icon there. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and go straight over the color tab. So this part here can be done with the free version of 
uh, DaVinci Resolve. When we get into the second and third parts of this tutorial, you, you're, it's going to be required that you have uh, the studio version of DaVinci Resolve, which is $295, or it comes free with a Blackmagic camera. Um, so think about just buying a camera to get this for free if you really want it that bad. A kid, of course. But $295, not too bad. Uh, it is a lifetime license. You get infinite upgrades and uh, support, so it's definitely a deal. All right, first thing we want to do here, we want to find our white balance. Um, where the hell did that go? We want to find our white balance, and there's two different ways we can do it. Uh, the first of which is using one of these uh, color calibration charts. And you can pick these up at Amazon. Obviously, this one, it's 14 bucks for two. It's kind of an kind of an easy, easy buy. Um, to be simple about it, right, if I use this here, I would just take this card and hold it out in front of the camera, and I would pull my white balance from this little square here. The rest of these don't really matter if you're just doing white balance. This uh, The color calibration chart is more for being able to color match cameras together. So if I'm on a film set and the DP uh, you know, has selected Arial X's or, or Red Komodos or something as, uh, as their primary cameras, and then they're going to use a GoPro shot from my quad, they this will allow them to color match the footage that comes off my GoPro to what's coming off the Arri or the Reds or what have you so that the color response is exactly the same as those other cameras within reason, right? I mean, a GoPro is not an Arri Alexa. We all know that. But it's going to be less less jarring. You're not going to be going from silky smooth Arri Alexa to, you know, chunky GoPro footage without color matching. But in this case, you can just use that, like that guy to pull your, pull your white balance. Now, this was my last pack of the day and kind of an impulse flight, so I did not use the color chart. So I'm going to have to pull white balance from some part in the footage that looks reasonably white or expected to be white. And I already have a place located in here. And I go uppy, uppy, uppy. And there is right there. So there's a little camper being pulled by a truck. Okay, so. We're going to zoom in on that with a mouse wheel and middle click and drag. There's the guy. So, come down here to my white balance picker. I'm going to just grab that. Now it changes my mouse cursor to a little uh, dropper. And I am going to look for white. So I don't want to go here because you see the RGB levels. 255 is the maximum level. And so they're just, they're clipped, right? You're not getting any color information. It's just pure white, but not the white we want. We want the white that was really white there in real life, not the white that we're seeing on our monitor. So I'm going to scooch down over here to the side of the camper and click. Now you can see it shifted my white balance a little bit. And I go back to fit and we'll roll this back a little bit. Now the colors seem a little bit more balanced. doesn't seem quite as warm so now the fun part here this is the magic this is gonna be it's gonna seem stupid simple when I show this to you I'm gonna turn this over so, so we can get get a chance to see here we're gonna go down here to the primary to the primaries with the color wheels but for the correction we don't have to touch the color wheels we're just gonna work with these values along the top and bottom all right so first thing I want to do I'm going to take my shadows here and just crank them all the way up to 100. All right? Looks kind of like ass up here right now. We'll get there. All right? Next, I'm going to take this pivot all the way up to 1. That's not going to have an effect right yet, but again, we'll get there. Now, here's the magic. We're going to use the contrast. We're going to move it up until our shadows look like where they're supposed to be. Uh, right about there. Okay? And that's it. Right? It increases the saturation naturally. It gives you great dynamic range. It doesn't crush the blacks. It doesn't blow out the whites. You get extra detail as well. Let's do a little contrast here. So this is with that correction on, with the correction off. Quite a difference, right? I haven't touched any saturation. I haven't added any plugins. This is all the information that's already on the GoPro. You can see, especially here, the kind of detail you're getting out of the trees against the water there. We can take it a step further, too. There's another magical slider I like. 
and get this where I want it to be. Okay, so this mid-tone detail slider right here. We start cranking this up. Look what happens to our image. See how much more detail we got? It kind of looks funky in a still frame, but once it's moving... looks pretty sharp, right? Because it kind of hides itself in the motion blur. Now, you can tune this. There's an aspect of this that some people don't like, and the horizon is a really great example of this. So you can see there's kind of a glow off the top of the mountain there. Well, that is caused by this mid-tone detail slider. If I crank it up, that glow becomes more prevalent, and if I turn it down, that glow disappears. Okay, so your mileage may vary. You tune this one to taste and use it as much or as little as you want. Okay. And also, um, if you find it feels too contrasty to you, so I'm going to reset the midtone detail. If you find it's too contrasty, right, you can take your shadows down a little bit and then reduce the contrast until your shadows are where they're supposed to be or where you feel like they're supposed to be. You really want to do this by sight. Okay, so now it's it's a little bit more contrasty than the than where we started, but it's not quite as punchy as it was. So if you want something a little bit smoother, you just reset the shadows to where you where you want it to be and then adjust the contrast until those values are where you want them until it looks right to you. Okay. You can see what happens when I crank my contrast. I get more detail out of the parking lot there. Now let me do that again. Okay, so there's no contrast. Added the contrast. Bring my shadows up and then I will adjust until my shadows look appropriate. You notice nothing is blown out. Maybe the reflections off the cars, but there's no part of the sky that's blown out. There's no none of the rocks that are overblown. Then if you want to get, uh, if you want to really extract a lot of extra color, we can take the saturation anywhere between 50 and 65. I would say 65 is the top end for the GoPro. Um, otherwise it's going to start looking like clownfish. Okay, so down to 65. In this, in this clip I'd probably just bring it to maybe 56. We just want a little hint of additional uh, saturation, mostly to keep that sky nice and blue. And if there are lots of um, clouds. There would be a lot more detail in the clouds, and uh, it would it would be very pleasant. You'd be able to see a lot of the detail in the clouds as well. You notice that exposure was very consistent as I was going past the trees, as I was going past the rocks, and now as I approach the parking lot, right, I'm, I'm exposed for essentially the trees and this darkness here, but the parking lot is not overblown. So this is a good starting spot, right, a good starting place for the creative look. And in order to achieve that, I like to do very subtle things. I mean, I've got lots of stuff, and sometimes I'll use these as starting points. Um, I tend not to use LUTs just because things get real complicated, and depending upon the kind of LUT, it'll actually discard some information that you might want to use. So, uh, if I use a LUT, I never use it at, at full. I will actually mix it down so it's maybe 25% effective on my frame. And to show you that, we would add another node using Alt-S not Alt-D. There we go. So this node here has all those corrections we made. This node is empty right now. And I'm just going to take this uh, Johnny FPV LUT, drop it on there. And that's that looks cool and everything, but it's too dark and the whites are too bright and it's way too saturated. So I'll go to this little icon here or my uh, qualifier keys and I'm just going to take the key output gain down to maybe yeah, maybe 0.25 so I get a little bit of a hint of that LUT but I'm not like destroying my footage with it 
and then I have less discarded information and I can still make other adjustments for a creative look without having to deal with shadows that are no longer there. So that's how I would use a LUT when I do, but in the case of this footage, since it's still like it's midday sun, so it's generally pretty warm, even though we got really great blues up there, if you look, especially coming down on this, right, that's pretty warm. The trees are a little bit warm of a green. So what I want to do is I'm, I'm just going to cool off the shadows. Basically, I'm doing half of an orange teal, like, Instagram look, I guess. Or, I guess back in the, in the 2010s, the orange teal color grading was the de facto standard for action movies and such. Um, it is very pleasant because it's a perfect color contrast. That's why people like it. That's why movie posters are always orange and teal or orange and blue. So we're going to go ahead and do that, and what I want to do is I just want to create a correction that only affects the dark parts of the frame, okay? So I am going to make a new node, and then I am going to go to my uh, qualifier here, and I'm going to turn off. So I could just, like, click that, and it would select all the things, but that's not what we're interested in doing right now. So I will go turn off the hue. Turn off the saturation. Since I'm looking for shadows, I'm going to pull the top of this down. Now, what I should have done first is turn on this little guy right here. So this sh this shows you what you've selected. So obviously I've selected nothing. So I need to pull this up until roughly just my shadows are selected. I get the water out of there. And then I'm going to take, this, is, this, is, this was the top of the band there, the H-Soft. You see it makes a little ramp. I'm just going to push that out a bit to smooth out the transition between the shadow correction I'm going to make and the remaining uh, colors. Now that I have this selected, I will turn this off and I'm just going to take my gamma, which would be mid-tones if you were worried about lifting gain, but gamma is going to affect it the most. I am just going to pull it slightly down towards the blue while looking at the shadows that gets cooled off. So now you got a little bit more blue along these guys and a little bit more blue in those darker crosses between the trees. But we still have the warm rock, the warm street and parking lot, and the warmth that are that's in the water out there. Alright, so let's take a let's back that up and take a look at what it looks like. You look at that rock face there. You still have the same warm colors there, but these have been tinted blue a little bit. And we're actually a little bit more aggressive than I would generally want, so I'm going to back these off just a bit. There we go. That looks pretty good. Let's add one more touch to this. Since we already have the warm, we don't need to adjust the highlights at all uh, for adjust their color, but we could if we wanted to. If you're dealing with something a little bit more neutral in the source, well, we've already selected our shadows. So instead of having to go through that whole process of selecting the highlights, we'll just right click this node, add node, and add outside. So what this does is it adds a mask that is what I didn't select in the first mask. It's the exact inverse along with the gradient and everything. So in this case, if I wanted to push my highlights towards orange, I would just go back to gamma, push those up towards orange. There we go. Kind of aggressive, but I mean, it's, this is the creative process. So I'm just kind of giving you an example. It's not what I suggest you do necessarily. Uh, what I would like, what I would invite you guys to do is find your own creative look and uh, run with that. But the point of this whole tutorial is that correction, is that first node there, right? It's this is, this is what we're looking for. This is how we take that garbage footage that we just got out of the GoPro, who looks like ass, right? And we turn it into this, give ourselves a good foundation where we can then apply these other corrections. And if I want to get real fancy, We'll add another node, and we'll go over to our power windows. We'll grab a circle, and then we're going to use a mouse wheel and zoom out so we've got some space. And I'm going to grab the corner here, and I pull this out until the most inner, the innermost line 
is right on the edge there. Okay, so this big thick line is the set, set diameter of the circle, and then between these two lines here is a gradient of how much that, that filter will affect it. So now that I've got that line along the bottom, we'll do the same thing on the side. Pull it out until that innermost line is right on the edge of the frame. And then we can pull the gradient out until the edge of the gradient touches the corner of the frame. Okay, now we've set our power window for our vignette. So what a vignette is, if you don't know, um, I, I guess uh, it, it, visually it's just a darkening of the corners and edges of a, of a frame. Um, where it comes from is some lenses uh, have a, a fall off of how much light they let through and hit the film or the sensor, and that fall off causes the corners to get dark, um, or the or, you know the corner and sides of the frames to get a little bit dark. Uh, it also happens if you have a lens that's not necessarily meant for the size of sensor or the or the type of film you might be shooting with, you can get some vignetting there. But it it, it can be used artistically to push the attention towards the middle of of a subject um, and kind of kind of almost like hugging the image. It doesn't like black it out. So in this case, I usually just drop my gamma down. But wait a minute, Joe, it's affecting the middle. We got to inverse invert the the uh, power window so now it affects what's outside of the power window instead of what's in it I'll readjust just want to darken the corners ever so slightly and then we'll turn this off so we can see it better set this back to 100 adds a little bit of aesthetics there and then, of course, I'd render it out. Um, so just as a by, by the way, I shot in 5.3K, so it's 5312 by 2988. My project is set to 4K, and there's a reason for that, and that's just a personal preference. Um, it's going to compress some of the hard edges in the original video down a little bit, so they take up less pixels, which the inherent, uh, the inherent effect is that you get some increased sharpness, natural sharpness, so there's no, like halos or anything around hard edges but you just get normal sharpness and then some of the uh, deleterious effects from the actual GoPro itself will become kind of crushed into nothingness by getting sampled at a different resolution um, noise is still kind of an issue uh, but uh, just also like playability playability is uh, kind of nice right it's hard some some systems won't play anything above 4k uh, depending upon how it's configured and the codecs installed. So after this, I'd want to deliver, and there's one key point during delivery that I want to talk about real quick. So if your goal is YouTube, then there's a specific setting I like to have. Um, the way the YouTube encoder works, you know how it gives you like all the way from 120p all the way up to the resolution that you that you uh, uploaded in. It all of those all of those separate transcodes plus the original transcode, the original resolution transcode are dependent on how good the original file are. So the better the file you can give YouTube, the better everything's going to look. Um, there's two options for giving YouTube a really good file. Uh, classically, a lot of people have done. Uh, oh crap! There we go. Classically, a lot of people have done DNX HR, and there are some really insane uh, delivery modes here. 12-bit is mostly like Dolby, uh, Dolby Vision. Um, the subsampling, the chroma subsampling, is is you want that to be as high as you can, so 444, and you want your bit your bit depth to be as high as you can. If you want to learn more about color bit depth and chroma subsampling, hit the links down in the doobly-doo, or Google it. I don't know if I get around to put links in the doobly-doo. There you go. Uh, but this produces an enormous file. We're talking like hundreds of gigs. Uh, and YouTube can only take up to 250 gigs per upload. So that can be a limiting factor if your video is a bit longer. Uh, it's also, if you have if you don't have a fat pipe going to the internet, it's going to take you a year and a half to upload it, and it'll probably something will probably crash or die or whatever before you get it fully uploaded. So an alternate route would be, we'll go to MPEG-4, H.265, turn on network optimization, and we'll leave the resolution as my standard project resolution. The encoding profile is the key thing here. So main is your basic SDR, standard 
standard dynamic range H.265 file that you can play on your computer or your phone or whatever. And then there's a 10-bit version of that. This main is, the chroma subsampling is 420. We want 444, and we also want 10-bit, okay? And the second thing I'm gonna do, uh, having the quality on best is not good enough. Even though it says best, it's not the best. We're gonna restrict it to 600,000 kilobits per second or 600 megabit per second. And H.265 doesn't have a constant bit rate profile. Um, that's kind of an old thing. It's only variable bit rate. Uh, so this means that at peak, it will it'll encode at 600 megabit per second bit rate. If there's like a ton of action or flashing on the screen or something of that nature, it'll crank up the bit rate. And then if you like say set the camera down to do nothing, the bit rate will drop super low. So uh, it's optimized for for space. This is going to give you a larger file than your original GoPro file, but only by maybe a factor of two. Another downside is once you render this file out, you won't be able to watch it on your computer. Uh, you would only use this file to upload to YouTube. Uh, for anything else, Instagram, TikTok, all that other stuff, you want to stick with your main profile and just use automatic best. You don't need a super high bit rate for Instagram. Nobody cares that much, especially for fucking TikTok, man. I hate that app, but I love it. Anyway, so you just stick with the normal stuff. Uh, even H.264 is fine. Now, if you don't have the studio version of DaVinci Resolve, this is going to use your CPU to encode and it's going to go really slow. So that's another reason why you might want to have uh, the studio version. There's a couple other reasons that I'll talk about in the next section about or in the, in the third section that maybe you, you might want to have the studio version. But encoding is definitely one of them because without the studio version, you don't get to use your GPU. You get to use the CPU, which in, in, at least in my case blows. So, uh, yeah. There's a, there's a part one for the hashtag, uh, the uh, hashtag no, no stab kids. Um, the color grading or the color correction part is the same for everybody. Okay, so if you've gotten this far, um, you're just going to add on the, the bits in the second and third uh, pieces and just redo this part, right? The, the actual color correction part. Um, so now moving on, we want to talk about adding some stabilization. Uh, and and lens dis, uh, distortion correction into the into the mix here. Uh, I think the the distortion correction is very important because when you get close to things and you have a linear uh, wi ultra wide angle like you get with the GoPro, it makes it look like you're going even faster than you are. Uh, it, it, for me, it's also just less nauseating if I'm watching freestyle and it's not the uh, warping all over the place. I know a lot of people who don't use the, stu the stabilization uh, will use the super view lens and if I can illustrate this here how it works but basically it's twisted like an S. If you could see the horizon in this shot it would be up down up down it's twisted that's how it gets a 16 by 9 frame out of a 4 by 3 sensor. Okay so I don't have any flat lines here to really illustrate that but, uh, you know, you watch as somebody blasts through a bando, you can see all the warping and everything, and it's just, it's for me, it's not pleasant. So moving on, we're going to pop open Gyroflow. Why am I using Gyroflow? That's a great question. I'm very glad you asked. I would love to tell you about it. Um, crap. So in Gyroflow, uh, obviously it supports GoPros, um, but it's there's a lot more things that you can tune as well. Um, I know a lot of people don't like real steady because you don't have a whole lot of control over how it does what it does, uh, which is unfortunate. Um, you can't, like, if you make it so it's not as smooth, then it's still pretty smooth. You could set the stabilization to zero and it's still quite a bit of stabilization. Um, and when you have quite a bit of stabilization, you have quite a bit of zooming in and out. And that's just generally, I mean, there's, an, there's a certain appeal to that because in certain points, like if you're zooming super fast and you're about to turn then it's going to start zooming in it's going to make you feel like make according to the viewer it's going to make it look like you're going faster than you are uh, that's not always a good thing because it could be just warping in and out all over the place and it's just generally not a good time uh, I like a little bit less stabilization than the minimum that real estate can give me uh, for a lot of what I do um, and there are situations where you want no stabilization but you still want the lens correction uh, or you want 
very smooth stabilization uh, that looks a little differently and reacts a little differently than what, than what real static would give you. So I'm going to just take that same original Go profile and drop it on here and it will automatically load the gyro data that's in the file as well as the video file but I need to, get, need to give it a lens profile. In this case it was Go here, GoPro Hero 10 Black 16 by 9 Super no electronic stabilization. If you know, if you recognize this also, uh, you can see that Gyroflow now supports the super view lens, the non-linear distortion that was kind of a, a sticking point for a while there. Now it works. So I'll select that one. <laughs> but I have to cut that out. <laughs> Need a drink. Okay. So now we've got our stabilization in. In Gyroflow, you can typically just hit play. It'll work. It's going to start off with my defaults, which are pretty simple. I'll kind of give you an, an idea here. So I have the lens undistorted, which kind of gives me a, a weird linear look in the in the corners. Yeah, heading up. And remember, this is a file we haven't corrected yet. This is the file right off the GoPro. Because as soon as we re-encode this file, we're going to lose that gyro track. I mean, there's a technical way you can keep that gyro track, but we don't want to dick around with that. So we're going to stabilize the unedited file first. You can see it's not quite as jello -y smooth as, as Real Steady would give you. You can still see some of my small movements on the sticks. And it doesn't zoom in nearly as much. To kind of get this look, to kind of break it down a little bit, there's a number of different methods for stabilization. Um, not all of them have anything to do with GoPro. Some of them are more like you want to take the bumps out of a camera that's on a tripod or uh, you want to stabilize in, in a 3D perspective. Um, but mostly we just want to stay on default uh, or you know, no smoothing if that's your thing. Okay, so on default, I take my smoothest to basically the smoothest is sampled in a period of time, right? However, however many moves in a period of time, the goal of the algorithm is to combine those, average out those moves, and then warp the image or zoom it and crop it and move it around to completely erase those movements that happen within that time frame. Um, so in the case of the smoothness here, which is the main part of the algorithm, I'm only sampling at 100 milliseconds. So, uh, or, uh, or a tenth of a second. Um, that basically means any anything that happens within a tenth of a second, any kind of movement gets averaged out and then combined with the next window of, of uh, one tenth of a second. And then those overlap as well. But there's a second smoothing pass that you can add, and this will kind of tune your smoothness a bit. Uh, so you, can, you can get rid of, like, this will probably get rid of all the vibration and judders and kind of smoothen any kind of... Uh, you know how like the if you have high rates and you're you have no stabilization you'll see every stick movement on on camera and it'll be very mechanical looking so this will this is enough to smooth that out we can get an additional smoothness that is um <coughs> not kind of uh smoothed at uh it, it's given a lesser weight than the primary smoothness factor so we're going to sample a 1.9 second window and we're going to give it not a perfect average. We're not going to take every single movement of, of any intensity and completely erase them. We're just going to damp them ever so slightly. And then the max smoothness at high velocity. So if we have in a 0.1 second window, we're spinning around or we're doing a flip, it'll stop damping beyond that. It won't do the second smoothness. So that when you do, say, a quick roll or a flip or a juicy flick or something like that, you're going to get the sharp points in that movement. It's not going to be muted like it would be in real steady and it'll just instead of zooming in to try to compensate it'll leave it where it is and allow that movement to happen um, so that's kind of a nice advantage there <coughs> and additionally you can simply turn smoothing off but maintain that perspective correction which in and of itself is still a better look to me than the uh, fish-eyed look. 
or you can have no lens correction and go with stabilization. A little weird, but that's an option if that's your thing. But I tend to like to have both. Pretty much every other setting here, you can just leave it alone. If you want to lock the horizon, you can do that too. And then in which case, you know, if you go vertical, it's going to zoom in to try and compensate until you turn it around. That's definitely a different look. That obviously increases your, uh, your zooming speed. So we're going to take that up there. Now, the key here, we want to maintain the quality because what we've done when we stabilized or we've done the perspective correction, we have stretched some of the original pixels that came off the GoPro. If you think about the pixels that came off the GoPro, I'm not ta I'm not talking about like the lens distortion that causes that a lot of it is com compu computational. So the pixels on the sensor have been stretched before it's written to a file. We're talking about the file we got off the GoPro. It's a nice even grid, right? It's that 5312 by 2988 grid. It's an even grid. Even though the image is squished and, and pushed by the distortion of the of the software lens, we have a nice even grid. Now when we do the this correction, we do the stabilization, we do the lens correction, right? Now we're stretching the, some of those original pixels. And what we what we need to do is we need to sample those pixels with a 444 chroma subsampling so that we maintain all of the detail. Okay, now that we have our stabilization set up, now is the key part here to maintain max quality. Now that we've stretched some of those pixels, we want to sample them with the highest color resolutions we can. So we want to use NVENC or NVIDIA uh, encoder as much as possible. So we're going to select H.265 HEVC. Now, obviously, the only thing we can select here is our bitrate, except that. Well, let's set, make sure you set your bitrate 600 megabit. Sounds good. Now we're going to hit advance. We need to convert this video so it comes in as 420 8-bit. We need to convert it to 444 10-bit. So we're going to add this line here, and I will post this in the doobly-doo for you. We add this line here to the custom encoder options. Once that's set, you can pretty much leave it. It's going to stay like that. Obviously, make sure you select the appropriate GPU that you want to use. And then you're going to hit export. And unfortunately, this is going to go about 5 frames per second because it has to use the CPU for some of the calculations, and, and unlike if we were uh, going straight to 420. So we'll hit export. And I've done it already, so we're going to overwrite. And we're going to go ahead and speed this part up so we all don't die of old age. And we're done. So now we take this file back into Resolve. Take that one off the timeline. I'll grab this one. Oh, again, you can't play these 444 10-bit files on your machine, but Resolve will play them just fine. So we're going to have a look-see at what we got. Not too bad. And then we can uh, take this guy, snip, snip, drop him on the timeline, go right over the color tab, and we'll run our same correction that we did in the first part of this tutorial. Grab our white balance, and we'll go shadows all the way up. Pivot to one and contrast tune until shadows are where they're supposed to be. And for my taste, I will add some midtone detail. Pretty 
pretty simple stuff. But we were able to take it through Gyroflow and bring it back into Resolve in literally better quality than the original file in that when we stretched it out for the lens correction, we turned some of the square pixels, we turned them into diamond shapes. And if we didn't increase the uh, chroma subsampling level to 444, we would have lost some of the detail because those diamonds don't fit into new, into the new squares that we encoded into the file coming back, right? Because now when we encoded it, we created another square array, right? It's just a grid. So when we stretch the original pixels, we're better able to sample them, which makes it less soft coming back into Resolve. So that's pretty much it. That's that's stabilization with the quality maintained and the color correction. Now moving on to part three, this is what I call hard mode, which is uh, how we get rid of the noise in the shadows. Since we're using an ND filter and our shadows are going to be a bit noisy, we want to add some denoising to it. And this is what's going to require the studio version of Dune Shears All because the temporal noise the temporal noise reduction is not in the uh, free version, but it is very powerful. However, we need to do it before we take it through Gyroflow, because as I said, we need to deal with square pixels. And to get as square pixels as possible, we need to denoise the original file first, while those the noise artifacts are square, or as square as possible, because some of them are stretched a little bit. But we need to denoise at that point, that, rather than after, um, because we'll have the greatest success in removing that noise. So let's go ahead and start over a little bit. Okay, we have our original file, but instead of our regular 4K, we're going to go at the native resolution of the file coming off of the GoPro. So master settings, we're going to set it to 5312 by 2988. And we need to make sure we take the entire clip. Can't be cut. We bring that back down to the timeline. We do nothing to it other than we go to the color page. That first node, we're going to go to this last bit here, which is uh, the noise reduction and motion blur tab. We're going to use temporal noise only because uh, spatial noise reduction is going to be, it's going to make it ugly. We're going to lose a lot of detail. So we're going to set it to five frames set it a better. Mushroom range is going to be large. And then down here we turn it on a little bit. We're going to set it to start. We'll set it to roughly 7.5. Kind of in the middle there. Alright, so let's take a quick look at it. Let me d disable this node and re-enable it. You can see in the shadows a little bit. This file doesn't have a whole lot of noise in it to begin with. You can almost play this, depending upon your machine, you can almost play this back in real time. Let me get to a little bit closer here. So down here is a good example. Turn this off. Not a great example. Let's go ahead and take a different file. One moment. Okay, so we're back. We got a new file. Uh, in this one, it's a little bit uh, closer to dusk, and I still have the ND32 filter on. Now you can already see the noise here. Let me see if I can do this. So we can see all the noise in the shadows. It's actually pretty prevalent. And the reason why I wanted to use this particular clip was because it does have a lot of visible noise. The other one would actually benefit from that noise reduction, but it would be a little bit more subtle. But the end result is that it ends up looking a lot smoother, even if there's not a lot of noise in the frame. Okay, so again, we'll take the whole thing down. We'll go to the color tab. Go to the motion effects tab. We're gonna set that to five, better, large, and 7.5 here. Type that in. Okay, so the thing of about temporal noise reduction is even still you don't see a whole lot of improvement, which is strange to me. So we can play with the motion range. It looks like small looks better here. But 
in a still frame you're still going to see the noise but you're going to see less of the noise when it's moving at full speed. So it tends to have uh, a smoothing effect on the noise where it's least and it minimizes any noise that's already in the frame. Alternatively, you can crank it up a little bit, which will give you slightly better noise reduction. You're still going to have the noise, but it's going to be less noticeable when it's moving at speed. Now, my machine can't play this real time with the noise filter on. Yours might be able to, um, but you can also cache it with the playback cache if you uh, want to see it in real time if you have a slower machine. Um, but now that we've got the noise applied and we're happy with it, it's not destroying our details too much. We're just going to go straight over the deliver tab. We're not going to make any corrections. And we're going to set this up just like we were delivering for YouTube earlier on. We're going to set this up. So let me select my folder here. And we'll just, uh, since I'm dealing with one, just go pro denoised. So, if you recall what I said earlier, when we transcode this, or we encode it to a new file, we lose the gyro data. And this is really important because we can work with this still with uh, gyro flow, whereas we can't do that with real steady. So I'll hit save, switch it over to M or H265. And remember, we're encoding at the original resolution of the Copro file, not the, not the delivery resolution. We'll do the same thing, restrict to 600 megabit main 10 444 so we get that sampling and uh, that's it so we'll add it to the render queue and we'll hit render all and it will take its sweet time rendering it out about 10 frames 10 15 frames per second give or take um, not as fast as just your regular main 10 or main 420 uh, again because it has to utilize parts of the CPU in order to uh, in order to get the pixel format changed over. We'll just go ahead and speed this up a little bit. And now we're done. And now that we have our GoPro denoise file, which is right here. We're going to take this into Jaroflow. So we pop open Jaroflow, and I want you to see what I'm doing here because we re encoded this GoPro denoise file, file has no gyro data in it, but we still have the original file from the GoPro. So we're going to drop our denoise file into the video to make sure we have our lens correction. Okay. Now, obviously, we don't have any gyro information, so we're going to go ahead and drop our original file into the motion data. And huzzah, we have gyro data. Now, there's a couple of things we have to do here because, I mean, if you just set or left this or set this to none, it would probably work because the gyro data is probably going to be the same exact length as the video data. But in case we missed a frame, we want to use VQF integration method. And we're going to go up here and hit auto sync just to make sure. And this takes a hot minute, so let's let's listen to some sweet music. Okay, there we go. Now we've got some sync points. Looks like about eh, a couple of milliseconds off. No big guy. No big deal. Now if we go back and play this, because that incoming file is so complex, it's going to be a little bit slow. Not a big deal. We'll survive. Okay, so now that we've gotten this done, we go ahead and sure up our smoothing. In this case, because it's more freestyle, I want to take my second smoothing path, smoothing pass, and just disable it, and then just kick down here. Make sure. Oh no, all this stuff didn't stay. That really sucks. Go profile two X FMT. YUV444P16LE. Boop. And that's pretty much it. Now, if we hit encode, which I'm not going to do because this will take forever. We, I've already killed you guys enough with it, so 
basically what we did in part two when we encoded. I'm going to make sure 600 megabit. And then we're exporting as 444. And you hit export and you'll get a stabilized video. And then you bring that stabilized video into Resolve. And you go to the color page. And then you mess around with, right, the pivot all the way up. Excuse me, sir. Excuse me, sir. Thank you. Pivot all the way up. Shadows all the way up. Oh. Find your... Find your white balance first. Hey, look. There's a white house. Maybe? Could be? Eh, maybe. Still looks a little too warm. But I'll take it. Wait, there's a good one right there. Oop. Gotta reset that. <laughs> Now we got our contrast, pivot all the way up, shadows all the way up, tune for a shadows. There we go. So this is obviously not the stabilized version, this is a denoise version because it didn't want to sit through the encode. That's why this is called hard mode because it takes a significant amount of time. Now just as a by the way, with regards to uh, Gyroflow, if you have multiple files, you can just add to the render queue and you can do all of them at once. And you can also synchronize all of the settings. So you don't really need to worry about your settings, except that you do need to go through and either set the integration method to none or use VQ VQF. Um, and then you can apply the settings to all items in the render and you can filter what gets applied to everything. By default, it's gonna be non-destructive. So um, you're not gonna like lose your trim ranges, which you can trim these files. Once you have them in here, you can trim them down. So you don't have to export so many uh, frames of just the quad sitting there or whatever. So you can do the basic editing here. And then you can also set um, how many number of parallel renders, depending upon your GPU uh, and your CPU capacity. You can have them going at the same time. might save you a little bit of time. And you can set this up to do whatever you want when it's done. Uh, just close gyro for all. And restart the computer, shut it down, explode, whatever. It doesn't fucking matter. Um, so that's kind of a nicety. Uh, I know with the original Real Steady, if anybody's ever used that, there was no way to batch them, and it took forever to render, and you couldn't even play back in real time. It seemed like the, the before time, back in the 1900s, that technology was so broken, and then they came out with basically Real Steady 2, which is the GoPro player. And it's it's a lot better. You can get real-time playback, um, but it crashes constantly, so no. And it doesn't do any advanced H.265 encoding. But it does have a really fancy Cineform encoder, which can give you some high quality, but you can't get 444 out of it. Um, so that is pretty much this tutorial, my friends. And if you last this long and you are going to adopt the hard mode way, uh, I, I commend you. Uh, it is time consuming because it requires two full renders of all of your files before you can actually get to the color correction and color grading part. But for those of you who just want to go through I mean, the color grading and or the color correction works with pretty much any kind of video. Um, works best with specific kinds of video, but uh, you don't have to go through and do the 444. You can just do a regular, you know, um, H.264, H.265, your basic settings, and it'll encode really quick, um, especially at a Resolve. If you have the studio version and only use a GPU for that encoding, it'll it'll come out like 60 frames per second. So. Uh, you can make some compromises in the workflow or you can stick with just the basics just pop the video and resolve do the do the correction throw a grade on there render it out and upload it to youtube or wherever you want to go um so it, it is as complex and time consuming as you want to make it uh but your highest quality plus getting some stabilization or just lens correction if you want to leave it unstabilized uh is that workflow of utilizing those complex codecs of h265 444 10 bit, even though it's overkill for the source video, the source video is only 420 8 bit. Um, but it'll, it'll help you maintain as much quality through the entire workflow as possible, even if you're just uh, overkilling, because you don't have 10 bits of color here, you have 8 bit color. But we're going to convert it into a 10 bit color so we get a little bit of breathing room and we maintain the amount of color, color detail and color volume as we go through different encoders, because it the video ultimately is going to be encoded three times before somebody watches it. 
there's a lot of opportunity to lose quality in those th three encodes. So that's what I've got for you. Um, if you have any questions, put them down in the place with the thing and uh, don't at me, I guess. I don't know. I'm just a guy. Uh, again, I hope this helps somebody. It gives you a good starting place to, to make something that's your own. Um, it is not the only way to do this, to accomplish this. It's not the only way to, to color your video or correct it. Um, this is just the way that I do. People have shown some interest in some of my video because I kind of set myself apart from other FPV pilots specifically with uh, how my video looks relative to theirs. And I've had some questions, so I decided to throw, it, throw together a little tutorial. So I just hope that's helped somebody. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll see you next time.